welcome back to my channel. Again, I'm filming a little bit later on in the week um, because I've, again, been quite busy this week with various online groups I attend. Obviously, groups that I normally meet face-to-face, -face, but because of the COVID situation, I've been meeting online and it's just been a busy week, really. Um, now, I wanted to talk about something this, in this video <laughs> because I just have to talk about it because it's a special interest of mine at the moment. And um, I do want to say... Um, just in case any of you don't like um, this sort of subject, you know, obviously um, I'm just telling you now what I'm going to be talking about because some people might find the subject matter a little bit gruesome. Um, but basically my special interest at the moment is smallpox. Yes, smallpox. Um, now, I've always been interested in uh, medical history anyway. I mean, you know, I've always had a sort of interest in that area. It's just at the moment um, I've become particularly uh, intensively, if you like, interested in smallpox. Um, and I wanted to find out more. I'm not entirely sure why I'm so interested in it at the moment, but maybe it's because of the COVID situation. Um, I don't know, but like smallpox is a disease that... I mean, if you think that obviously COVID is a really serious disease and it's killing loads of people and it's not, you know, it's, it's, really, it's a really dire situation and it's a dangerous disease. Um, but smallpox is even more, obviously, is, you know, a significantly <laughs> worse than COVID. Um, but it's a disease that thankfully no longer exists because it was eradicated thanks to vaccination. And uh, so we no longer have to uh, deal with it. It's uh, now just a historical curiosity and hopefully it will remain that way. I say hopefully because there's a very small risk. Um, it's unlikely, but it's not, it's not beyond the realms of possibility that it could potentially be used by, um, in bioterrorism activities. But um, hopefully it will remain a historical curiosity. So I've been, uh, yeah, just very interested in it and um i don't know why but i've been like i can't stop looking i know it's morbid but i can't stop looking at uh smallpox uh pictures um on google images like looking at pictures of people with smallpox i don't know why because like i said it is morbid um but you know if people do have weird interests okay maybe it's a bit weird but you know i'm sure there are people out there who are just as interested in smallpox as i am and other diseases, and um, people have all sorts of weird interests, and mine just happens to be smallpox right now. Don't ask me why, it just happens to be my interest. Maybe, it might be at some form of psychological displacement, because it's, you know, it's a disease that we no longer have to deal with, and that's a lot worse than COVID, so it's like, I'm very scared about COVID, I have OCD, but maybe it's because smallpox is something that is an historical curiosity, it's something that's extinct, and... So it's not going to, uh, it's not like a threat I have to worry about. Um, and I just find it very interesting, although it is very gory. Uh, so a book I've been reading, um, and there are other books on smallpox that I might check out as well, but this, is, this was a really good read. Um, I really very enjoyed reading this book. So if you, do want to, if you are interested in smallpox like I am, I do recommend this book. It's called The Angel of Death, and um, The Story of Smallpox by Gareth Williams. And the picture on the front, by the way, is Edward Jenner, the so-called father of vaccination. Although it's a little bit of a misnomer, because Edward Jenner wasn't the only person um, to vaccinate. There were actually people before Edward Jenner who'd, re who'd already um, used vaccination before him. But he gets all the credit for it because he was the main person who sort of publicised it and popularised it. Um, but on the front we have Edward Jenner, an English country doctor from, um, from, from Gloucestershire. Dairy County, um, vaccinating um, his son there with his lancet. Um, and I say uh, Dairy County, I make a point of saying that because obviously if anyone who's, who's, who knows about smallpox or, or, or has a basic uh, historical knowledge of, of, of smallpox or what happened, uh, vaccination derives from uh, cow cowpox that's latin for cow um and um it was um edward jenner who uh put two and two together 
um, and really, um, I mean, there were, as I say, there were people before Edward Jenner who had come to similar kind of conclusions, but it was Edward Jenner who, who first really kind of experimented and kind of um, developed the idea. But um, it was like folk knowledge that milkmaids didn't get smallpox um, and had pock-free beautiful faces as a consequence because they got a related con uh, disease called cowpox, which is a lot milder than smallpox um, and um, isn't usually lethal, unlike smallpox, um, but would confer immunity against um, smallpox because they're related viruses. They, they belong to the same family, the pox virus group, and um, the proteins on the uh, virus coat are only slightly different, so the immune system will recognise, will respond the same way to each. So um, a milkmaid who gets cowpox becomes immune to smallpox. And um, Jenna then um, came to the conclusion, you know, that if you took some cowpox um, and then um, in, in gave, that, gave the cowpox, uh, injected the cowpox, the lymph containing the cowpox, into um, a healthy subject, but then they would develop immunity to smallpox. And that's where we get vaccination from, because... Um, yeah, vax, Latin from cow. So that's interesting. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so I, I found out a lot of in, very interesting facts about smallpox. Uh, smallpox, the actual virus name, is um, variola. The variola virus. And vari, variola um, deri is derived from the Latin for spotted. Now, um, there is some speculation as to exactly where the variola virus came from because it doesn't appear to have existed, um, it doesn't appear to have existed in classical or biblical times. In classical or biblical times, it seems to be the case that they did not have classical smallpox. When I say classical smallpox, I mean the really extreme, severe disease that we know of today as representing smallpox, the angel of death, um, as it was often called. Instead, they did have a far milder um, relative of um, uh, classical smallpox, however, and I'll come on to that in a moment, but they didn't seem to have classical smallpox. And um, the birth of smallpox um, is actually comparatively recent in terms of human history. The theory goes that sometime in our distant past, a wild gerbil virus called, I don't know if I pronounce these correctly, or I'll give it a go, <laughs> it's a long word, called um, Tataropox, the Tataropox virus, which affects wild gerbils. Sometime in our distant past, this virus mutated. And that mutation enabled it to jump the species gap over to humans and affect humans. In doing so, the virus also changed and became a new virus, variola virus. This new virus was na um, then it became, if you like, humanized. So no other animal can be infected with the variola virus. It became a, it was a human virus. But it originally, for the evidence suggests, and this is speculative, but there is strong evidence to suggest that it evolved from the Tatarapox wild gerbil virus. Um, the Tatara uh, gerbil, hence the name Tatarapox virus. And uh, this is because the DNA sequence is the nearest to variola. Variola is a DNA virus. Here, virus. Uh, viruses can be either DNA or RNA, and variola is a DNA virus. It suggested that the initial mutation began between 16,000 and 68,000 years ago. Then, a second mutation occurred, whereby variola mutated again. So first of all, the tetrapox virus uh, mutated so that it could be passed over to humans. But the, but the crucial mutation occurred when a tetrapox virus changed its spots, if you like, and turned into variola, which could now only infect humans. And that was the second mutation. 
The first mutation was, was what enabled it to cross the species gap, and that occurred between 16,000 and 68,000 years ago. The second mutation um, and, um, led to it turning into variola, and that um, spinned off variola minor between 1,400 and 6,300 years ago, probably somewhere in Africa. Now, variola minor is a very mild disease. Unlike classical smallpox, it has, um, I mean, it can still kill, you know, it can still kill, um, but compared to, to, to um, classical smallpox, it's a mild disease. The mortality rate is um, at its highest, around 2%, but at its lowest, under 1%. A lot milder than classical smallpox, and it can be very mild, depending on the exact strain. And at its mildest, it's no more severe than chickenpox. Um, so, so that occurred um, somewhere in Africa, they think. And it was variola minor that existed during classical and biblical times. But it didn't usually kill, unlike variola major. It had a low mortality rate compared to variola major. But then another uh, separate mutation occurred, probably in Asia, around 400 and 1,600 years ago. And it was that, and it's get that mutation that resulted in variola major, what we think of as classical smallpox, a very severe disease that carries a 20%, um, around 20 to 50% mortality rate, in some cases even more than that. Um, and this is full-blown smallpox. But as I say, full-blown smallpox had not yet arrived in classical or biblical times. They only had variola minor, its milder cousin. And then when variola major, when variola, when variola major um, occurred, the two strains of the virus coexisted alongside each other. So variola major was far more common than variola minor. Variola major, if you like, had a trump card. Um, it outdid variola minor. Um, but variola minor coexisted alongside variola major. And if you caught variola minor, you were very lucky because variola, not only was variola minor um, usually quite a mild illness, I say usually because there were caveats to that. In some cases, it could be a lot more severe. It, at its worst, it could have a mortality rate of about um, 10%. Um, and some, some varieties that were more closely related to variola major could be a lot more severe. But at its mildest, its mortality rate could be under 1%. And if you were lucky to get a very mild strain of variola minor, you were also protected against variola major for life. So you were very lucky. Most people, of course, weren't so lucky because variola major was the predominant type for much of human history. It was only in the 20th century that variola minor overtook variola major in North America and parts of Europe. So, so as I say, so when the Tatarapox virus um, crossed the species gap, it mutated again, and when it mutated again, this severed all connections with other animals. This actually enabled its elimination because it made elimination a lot easier because it did not hide in other animals. So this helped it to be eradicated. The problem with COVID and why it might be a lot harder to eradicate COVID, or one of the reasons why it might be a lot harder to eradicate COVID, is that COVID um, can infect other animals, which is going to make it a lot harder to eradicate. And um, some say it's impossible to eradicate it, but time will tell. But variola was now a completely human virus. It could not hide in other animals. The incubation period for smallpox was about 12 days. Then there was a prodromal period uh, where the patient would experience fever, a severe headache, back pain and possibly vomiting. That lasted for a couple of days. During this period they were highly infectious but they did not have any rash yet. So, and because obviously those symptoms can easily occur in other diseases, and, we, and you know, there's a lot of kind of uh, overlap with other diseases in those symptoms, um, it wasn't all right. And of course, we're talking about, you know, in the past when there were many other diseases as well as smallpox, you know, cholera, things like that, malaria. It could be hard to tell these diseases apart. So it wasn't until the patient had the characteristic rash 
that they were often put into isolation because people didn't know yet that it was smallpox and obviously that helped to aid its spread. Um, so I'm going to move over on to video number two now to carry on this little historical um, talk about smallpox. So moving on to video number two now.